Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar on fencing and flagery pathways to implementation. We'll give folks just another minute to jump on here before we get started. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, this is the webinar on fencing and flagery about talking about pathways to implementation. And again, this is the second webinar in a three-part series on the three practices that our team at the Conflict on Working Lands Conservation, Conservation Innovation Grant are working on. So today we'll be hearing from landowners, NGO and agency staff who are using different types of electric fencing to minimize interactions and prevent depredations with wolves and grizzly bears. But before we go into that, we have a few introductions to share. So um, first, I'll just start by introducing myself. My name is Alex Few, and I'm the Working Wild Challenge Coordinator at Western Landowners Alliance. Our mission at Western Landowners Alliance is to advance policies and practices that sustain working lands, connected landscapes, and native species. And Western Landowners Alliance is just one of the many partners on this project that we call the Conflict on Working Lands Conservation Innovation Grant, or CowSIG for short. And so um, this is funded by a conservation innovation grant from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS. And Jared Beaver, um, here on screen with me from MSU, will be talking a little bit more about this project in just a minute. But before we go on any further, I just want to say a real special thanks to NRCS. You all have been a great partner in this project, and I just want to say thank you very much for all of the work that you all are doing with us. So um, again, just a super special thanks to NRCS. So with that, I'm going to bring my slides back up. Um, so just a minute here while I jump back and forth between screen sharing. All right. Um, so again, today's webinar is part of a three-part series to share information with ranchers and NRCS staff about producer implemented techniques for managing predation and production risks caused by large carnivores on the landscape. Um, so today's webinar is about fencing. Um, we have an, our third webinar in the three-part series happening on October 18th from noon to 1.30 Mountain Time. And you can register for that at this link that I'm gonna share in the chat box. So, um, Matt, I'm gonna put the link in the chat box if you would send it out to everybody. I would appreciate it. Um, so the next webinar again is on October 18th and we'll be talking about carcass management. If you missed the previous webinar on range riding, you can view the recording by registering for that webinar series, and then you'll get a link to see the recording. Um, and you can register directly here, and hopefully, Matt, you can share that in the background with everybody. So um, as we get started talking about fencing today, I just want to acknowledge that there are lots of different ways that fencing is applied across the many different landscapes in the West. Um, for today's purposes, we're going to focus on the application of electrified fencing to manage the risk of predation by bears and wolves. So the type of fencing in this photo is called turbo flagery. It's a type of electrified flagery, so a temporary fence that's put up. But you know, there are many different ways that people are using flagery. So here you can see an example of electrified woven wire protecting a carcass so that it can uh, be investigated to determine the type, why it, it was, how it was killed. Um, 
And then in a separate slide here, we've got an example of another fence. So this fence is along the Rocky Mountain front in uh, just east of Glacier National Park. This particular ranch is thick with grizzlies. And so the rancher put up a permanent night pen for his sheep that is electrified. And um, that's helping reduce predation and giving um, his animals, you know, helping to reduce stress from those animals. So there, within all of these different types of, of fencing uh, and the other practices that we're discussing in the webinar series, these are all really non-lethal tools. And we want to be clear that our project partners recognize that these conflict prevention practices or non-lethal tools are just one part of a framework for conflict reduction that we call the four C's. So the four C's are compensation, conflict prevention, again, these non-lethal tools that we're talking about today, control, meaning lethal control, and collaboration. So I'm just gonna walk through this framework really quickly. So compensation, like that carcass that was being protected for subsequent depredation investigation, we think that compensation needs to be equitable, given that widely valued wildlife like wolves and grizzly bears um, are, are spreading across the landscape. Um, the cost of providing habitat for these highly mobile species really is something that we believe should be shared by society. Conflict prevention tools are designed to deter wildlife and in particular interactions with these large carnivores like wolves and grizzly bears. And funding to support these tools is needed to give producers the time and resources to find what works for their individual operations and landscapes. And lethal control is a critical tool that supports conflict prevention and does not undermine it. So solutions for conflict on working lands require that all tools are in the toolbox and lethal control is one of those important tools. And, and last, the last fourth C is collaboration. So collaboration is key. We know that solutions go nowhere when the people who must implement them are left out of the planning process. So we appreciate you all being here today in the spirit of collaboration. Um, you know, we really embrace this four C's approach because we see that it leaves room to adapt solutions to the social, economic, and ecological conditions that are unique to each community across the West. So when all four C's are available, we can build stronger partnerships, more resilient ranches, and ultimately better connected landscapes that sustain the culture of the West, including its people and wildlife. So at this point, I'll pass it off to Jared Beaver, one of our partners on the CalSIG. He's a professor at Montana State University in the Department of Animal and Range Sciences, and he's also the Wildlife Management Extension Specialist in Montana, and he's gonna talk more about our CalSIG project. Thanks, Alex. Um, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Um, everybody, thanks for joining us again. As, as Alex mentioned, our Conflict on Working Lands Conservation Innovation Grant, our CalSIG team. Um, you know, really, our project team came together around a common theme, which was trying to determine how best to share and manage a wild working landscape to sustain both people and wildlife. And that's because often the biggest problem with the landowners face and natural resource practitioners alike is how do you balance the needs of both people and wildlife? And this project team uh, in particular believes that that is best done through collaborative knowledge exchanges, transparent participatory research, and ultimately partnerships that foster trust. We also believe a key to success in, in this arena of, of wildlife conflict mitigation is finding ways to reduce the financial cost of sharing working lands because minimizing wildlife livestock conflicts and in this particular project predator livestock conflicts is essential to both wildlife conservation and agricultural production alike. And so it's really highlighting those win-wins and, and trying to amplify those. And so our current project which is supported by SIG, which is from the Natural Resource Conservation Services in RCS, is to study three techniques, range riding, carcass management, which will be next month, and then various fencing flattery scenarios, which is our focal point today. And these three practices are, are really being 
implemented and refined uh, across a land steward network right now spanning seven western states as a result of this project. That research is ongoing and really we're looking to understand how and where to implement these three practices to best support habitat use by wildlife uh, while decreasing predator conflict with livestock. And so that project team uh, is featured from Heart of the Rockies, uh, Western Landowners Alliance, MSU Extension, and multiple universities, including Utah State, Colorado State University, and then of course, uh, USDA as a part of that as well. And really the stakeholders involved with our team in this project are from across all of these various organizations cover a broad spectrum from wildlife researchers, extension personnel like myself, landowners, uh, and natural resource practitioners. And ultimately, as, as Alex mentioned, the vision of our project and the reason this team has come together was to cultivate resilient ranches, healthy rural communities, and, and connected landscapes. And as a team, this has worked really well because we believe that this involves three key focal areas, uh, better refining conflict mitigation strategies, developing sustained financial and technical assistance for implementing those mitigation techniques, and then lastly, creating stronger partnerships for a more efficient and effective delivery of the information learned as well as knowledge exchange opportunities. And that's why we believe events like today really encompass all three of those and help push the needle forward. And we're just uh, really excited about the expertise we have on our panel today and of all the participant and involvement. So again, thank you for joining and, and hope to see you next month as well. So. So thanks, Jared, for that great introduction. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Bree Owens, Western Landowners Alliance's stewardship coordinator, and she'll be talking about a risk assessment framework and landscape stratification um, that we're thinking about as a planning tool to assist with cost sharing on these practices. So thanks, Bree. Thanks, Alex. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to talk through this, this framework that we have been developing on risk assessment and practice evaluation. Um, you know, thinking that assessment is really kind of an inventory of the situation um, and allows us to look site specifically at an operation and then carry that into an evaluation of which strategies make the most sense for that operation. Um, but before I jump into the framework, um, I'm gonna take a little step back um, and touch on a few of the things that Jared and Alex brought up in the introduction. And so, you know, one of our, our questions that we asked early on as, as we're collaborating with partners across the West that are dealing with livestock predator conflict is, is there a role for NRCS and technical and financial assistance delivery um, to deal with this disproportionate burden that is being placed on Western landowners and, and other landowners will um, hear from uh, um, David, uh, who will be sharing from the upper Midwest and the situation there. Um, but so that, that was our question. And what we heard from partners and what we really heard from landowners and from livestock producers is that they said, we think so. We think there's a role for NRCS. And so we were fortunate uh, to be able to apply for the Conservation Innovation Grant, um, which had a priority that year for looking at non-lethal predator management strategies. And so timing wise, it really lined up nicely, um, but also recognizing that there has been a, a long history building up to um, this SIG project um, and conversations that have been going on, um, you know, for 10 plus years um, of looking at what the potential role for NRCS is in this space. Um, and, and thanks to the partners in Montana um, who have really advanced that conversation over the years to get us to this point now. Um, so partners, as I said, they, they said, we think so. And I, I think it's important to note that 
part of the reason they said we think so is that NRCS is the most trusted agency partner um, in providing assistance on working lands, really with a goal of balancing stewardship and ag production. Um, and, and so we know that they are a trusted partners of landowners, of ag producers. And so as we developed this SIG project and the team came together, um, we have been working off of two guiding principles. And, and that is that our work through this project needs to be in service to ranchers and it needs to be in service to NRCS as those are the two key stakeholders um, in, in this project. Of course, with critical input from others, um, other agencies, other um, conservation partners, as Alex mentioned, this is in the context of the 4Cs framework. Um, and so a lot of different partners um, you know, that are, are addressing conflict reduction have different roles to play. Um, but today specifically, and through this webinar series, we are talking about what is the potential role of NRCS. And so um, as we have moved along in this process over the last year and a half, two years um, through the Conservation Innovation Grant, increasingly what we've learned as we're synthesizing all the information across partners, um, across participants, and learning more through the process is that now partners are saying, yes, there is definitely a role for NRCS in this. And so we're really excited that um, an interim practice standard has been drafted um, and is currently in review looking at these three practices. Um, but now comes the question of, you know, so if we are, if there is an interim practice standard or another avenue by which NRCS can work with ranchers, to support the delivery of these practices on the ground, there's a lot of other steps that need to be addressed. And so those of you that work for NRCS, you're obviously very familiar with um, the conservation delivery framework, the conservation planning process, um, and, and the various steps and then tools that are used to advance that process working with landowners. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk through today specifically about this framework um, for risk assessment practice evaluation that we think can support the conservation planning process. Um, and this is, I think, really looking at probably steps one through six um, of the process. And so again, kind of that early assessment piece, which is gonna help to identify problems and opportunities on a specific operation. Um, and, and I think this will help support that, you know, these practices obviously do not apply to every livestock producer. Um, there are specific locations across the West that we know there is an elevated risk um, of conflict with large predators, specifically with wolves and grizzlies, um, where, where there is a need um, from those producers that are operating in those regions. Um, and again, in the upper Midwest, um, and so it allows us to kind of, um, you know, uh, just go through a, a process. Um, sorry, the I have a specific word I want to use and it's <laughs> escaping me right now. Um, but um, it, it's a selection process basically of understanding, you know, where these practices will apply and with what landowners. Um, and so, I am going to jump into this framework um, and, and how we're thinking about this. And just letting you know that this has been developed by the, the team um, and this broader team that is represented by the core SIG team, um, which really represents the, the knowledge and experience of over 600 landowners, livestock producers across the West. Um, so this is a significant wealth of knowledge that we are working from and have been developing um, both the, you know, the evolution of the practices and how to apply them, but then also how to think about where they should be applied on the landscape. Um, so these are the factors that we have come up with in this risk assessment process, um, looking at species, what type of livestock, predators and prey that are on the landscape and what the density of those is looking at the place itself, the landscape itself, and what are the biotic and abiotic conditions that exist that might influence the risk for predation. Um, time is critical. Um, everything happens within time, whether that's an annual framework or um, a longer time frame. 
of, you know, as predator populate, predators are expanding across the West, that changes the time influence, um, but also just thinking about that annual production cycle and life cycle. Um, disturbance events, these are events that influence the behavior and the ecosystem dynamics, um, and so that is going to change up the relationship of predator prey and livestock on the landscape. Um, and then landscape land use, and I'm going to jump to the next slide here. This is really how we are trying to think about landscape and land use and putting it in a, a visual way um, that we can start to think about where these practices apply most um, in, in terms of risk. And so just gonna throw this up and then we'll go into um, each factor a little bit more and then come back to this. And just encourage you to think about this um, especially in the context of fencing and flagery. And that's, we'll, we're gonna highlight that today. Um, and our, our speakers will be sharing, you know, from their experience, different types of fencing and where they're applying them um, on their operations and on operations with their partners. Um, but this will, I think, give you a visual, you know, idea of where different types of fencing might apply. Um, but we certainly are using this landscape stratification and risk assessment process to think also about carcass management and range riding and where those practices might apply. Okay, so just a little bit more um, on species. You know, again, thinking through the type, the age class, and the population density um, of livestock predators and prey. Um, you know, different predators require a different response to manage the risk associated with them. They hunt in different ways. They use the landscape in different ways. Um, and then obviously with livestock, we know that we are grazing livestock in different ways. Um, they have different production cycles depending on the landscape that we're operating in um, and different risk factors. If we think about, you know, cattle versus sheep um, and, and the risk factor, and then also different age classes. So the, the risk of, you know, to a young calf or a yearling as compared to a cow. Um, and then of course, thinking about the, you know, the native food source of elk, deer and other critters and what that looks like on the landscape. Um, so place, this is again, thinking about the abiotic and biotic conditions. Um, so is the terrain rough? Is it rolling? Is it flat? Um, what's the visibility? Um, this is particularly important, you know, um, within shrub and timbered landscapes. Um, a lot of producers um, are dealing with uh, conflict on Forest Service allotments um, that are heavily timbered. And how does that influence, you know, the movement of the animals, the grazing availability, forage availability, but then also the ability to implement certain practices. Um, and particularly if we're thinking about fencing, our speakers will touch on this, um, that the, you know, the condition of the landscape, even um, we'll, we'll get into things like snow and rain here in a sec, but um, the vegetation community type can really influence what type of fence you're going to use and the, the density of the vegetation. Um, timing, again, thinking through the annual life cycle of both um, predators on the landscape, the natural prey base, and then also the production cycle um, of livestock. And, you know, as we're thinking about risk, where are livestock at different times in that production cycle, depending on, you know, is it calving season? Is it weaning? Um, what is our grazing rotation looking like? And that in time with what are our bears and wolves doing on the on the landscape as well. Um, disturbance. Again, these are events that can strongly influence um, the way that wildlife or livestock are behaving on the landscape, how they're interacting with the landscape. Um, so this could be weather, if it's snowpack, if it's rain, um, and, and this, these certainly also will then influence what tools make sense to put out on the ground and at what time of the year um, it makes sense to put those tools out there. Um, recreation is certainly um, an influence 
Um, it can, you know, have impact on the native prey base, um, which can then have impact on predators and, and how they're using the landscape. Um, so there's a lot of things to think through in terms of um, disturbance. We hear from partners that uh, hunting season can certainly uh, change risk. And in some locations, it seems to elevate risk and push predators more onto livestock. And in other locations, it seems to reduce risk um, and, and pull predators away from livestock. Um, so again, this is all really site specific, but this allows us to have those conversations um, on each rancher within each community. Um, and then again, you know, thinking through landscape and land use. And so this idea of stratification of the landscape and thinking about where are more intensive uses within an ag operation, where are the less intensive uses that might be a shared uh, piece of the landscape, and then what are those areas that we might consider predator occupied, um, and we'll talk about this on the next slide a little bit, but thinking through in time and space um, as that moves or changes throughout the season um, as predators are, are going through their annual life cycle. Um, we know things like the size of an operation can certainly influence the ability to deploy different tools. Um, this definitely, you know, land use and landscape um, is a really important element to think about and you'll hear this from the speakers um, in terms of the different types of fencing or flagery um, that make sense to address the issue. Okay, so back to the stratification slide um, and thinking visually about this. Um, you know, I, th to me, this is very similar. Again, those of you who are familiar with NRCS and the conservation planning process, um, this would be similar to developing a conservation plan map. And if you were developing a grazing management plan and thinking through infrastructure to support a prescribed grazing plan, um, you know, we can map that out based on the resources that av are available, the goals of the operator, um, and, and just the landscape condition, and then the plan moving forward and hoping to address the resource concerns that have been identified through an assessment process. Um, and so we're looking at a very similar process and being able to, you know, map this out. Um, and I think for, you know, the producers that are on today, you can think about this on your own operation. Um, you know, whether you, you have predators right now that you are dealing with, um, or, you know, for folks like in Colorado or in places where um, predators are dispersing, um, we can think about this as well. For our own operation, what does it look like? Where do we think about how are animals using it and how does it fit into the context of our production cycle? And, and what are the tools that we can use? So, you know, Again, I don't. I think the the panel will really get into talking about the different types of fencing and where they apply um, in the context of each of their operations and their landscape. And um, I'm excited to hear this discussion because they are certainly operating in different landscapes. Um, and so I think it'll give us a good sense for this. Um, but a couple of examples, real quick. You know, with those images that Alex showed. Um, in the beginning of, you know, where you might put flagery, um, it might be a flagery offset around an existing calving pasture or weaning pasture that has an existing permanent fence on it. Um, it might need to be something that's more fortified, um, depending on the time of season when you're weaning. Again, if it's a cow-calf operation or sheep operation, it might be fortifying an existing fence um, with hot wire. Um, with like high, high tensile um, hot wire. Um, and then other uses, you know, where flagery might apply, you see on this slide, there's kind of a representative um, of like where a den site might be or a rendezvous site. And so if we're thinking about cattle grazing across this landscape and moving through pastures that are down in this like meadow system and up into the forested pastures, um, depending on you know, if timing wise in a pasture rotation, cattle are going to be down in that meadow close to that den site, it might make sense to just to put flagery up temporarily um, as, as a barrier 
between livestock um, and and that wolf pack, um, and then thinking that it it might be used just to bump them, um, and so that they might you know carry on through their their normal travel paths, which are represented here by um, the red lines, um, which are just roads and trails um, that a wolf pack might be using consistently. Um, so those are just some examples of the different fencing, but like I said, um, we're gonna hear a lot more um, from the panelists. And so I'll turn it back to you, Alex, thank you. Thanks, Bree. Um, I really appreciate that you know, really thoughtful list of factors to consider. You know, we get so many questions about, you know, how should I build a fence? What, you know, where's the right, what's the right fence to build? And, and it is a really great framework to evaluate that decision-making. Um, so next up is Josh Schreckengost. He's uh, from NRCS and is the district conservationist in Deer Lodge, Montana. And he'll be talking with us about conflict management and the conservation planning process. Um, so I'm excited to hear about some of the partnership he can talk to. So thanks for joining, Josh. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I'm gonna give everyone a, a little bit of a case study in how NRCS can be part of the, the financial and the planning process as it applies to conflict mitigation. Um, in in my one of my counties that that I work in Powell County Montana the the northern half of that county is in the Blackfoot River drainage um, that's just south of the scapegoat and Bar Bob Marshall wilderness there's a high concentration of grizzlies there as part of the northern continental divide ecosystem um, that also happens to be home to the Blackfoot challenge which is a private uh, nonprofit conservation organization that's that's been around and has set um, a lot of standards for what can be done at a community level uh, with community levels as, or community members as it applies to conservation. Um, the Blackfoot Challenge, the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and US Fish and Wildlife Service have been dealing with grizzly conflict there for some time. Uh, the Blackfoot Challenge received a conservation innovation grant about four years ago, um, specifically looking at using electric fence, uh, five wire, high tensile, and electric drive over mats, similar to a cattle guard in concept, but specifically for keeping grizzly bears out of areas with attractants. Um, they got the CIG to look at those practices to see if there was ways to improve them, to evaluate their effectiveness, and also to compare a couple of different designs of drive over mats. About that same time that they were implementing that CIG, Montana transitioned the way that we administer our EQIP environmental quality incentive program dollars. Um, Many places throughout the country, in fact, most have used larger fund pools where applicants apply for EQIP dollars and might be competing for those fundings uh, against projects that, that have nothing to do with one another uh, across all across the state. Montana changed that in 2019. And rather than using a traditional EQIP funding process, we went to what we called Montana Focus Conservation. For those of you that are familiar with special initiatives, you could think of Montana Focus Conservation as special initiatives on, on a micro scale. So we, we evaluate and determine that we have a, a particular resource concern in an area that we could really focus in on and have measurable goals across, or measurable outcomes across multiple landowners. And then it, at, at the local level, we present that project uh, for funding and our state leadership then determines if it's investment ready or not. Um, then we take applications within that particular area for its own special fund pool. And we did just that with this, it's called the, the Grizzly Conflict Mitigation Targeted Implementation Plan. 
targeted implementation plan is, is just our jargon for, for the funding vehicle for it. The, the point is that uh, through our partners at the Blackfoot Challenge, especially with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and US Fish and Wildlife Service, we had this resource concern of grizzlies getting into trouble whenever they found anthropomorphic attractants um, that the data suggests were concentrated around ranch headquarters areas and also uh, calving areas in particular. So we put together a, a project for EQIP where we were going to cost share on the fences and the electric drive over maps. The problem at that point was that NRCS didn't have practice scenarios or, or a way to fund these. So using the model that the Blackfoot Challenge and partners had proven worked for five wire high tensile electric fence and for electrified drive over mats, we were able to get those uh, as practice scenarios under the structures for wildlife uh, practice standard. They may or may not stay there um, as, as uh, Bree and Alex mentioned, there, there's interim standards coming around that might kind of gobble those up, but that's fine. It, it doesn't matter so much where they're at is that we have been able to implement those. In fact, our first two equip contracted grizzly fences and electric drive over mats are the construction is going to start tomorrow. Um, so I will be out there with the contractor looking at those projects being implemented. Um, but uh, this, this whole process um, has been met with mixed reviews, you know, at the, the regional and the national level for NRCS, because there's, there's varying opinions on it, quite frankly, as to whether or not NRCS uh, needs to be part of conflict mitigation with predators. Um, here in Montana, we think that it is a legitimate resource concern for us to be involved in. We have de a definite need for it and a very strong partnership that is supportive of it. So, th so the answer for us is yes, this is something that we can spend farm bill dollars on, have measurable outcomes that have benefits both to agricultural producers and the taxpayers at large. So it makes a lot of sense for us. But our, our stance from the beginning has been that it, it is a tool that we want to have in the toolbox, but we're not trying to force it on anyone else. You know, that's, it's up to each state and, and each, uh, you know, field office within NRCS to decide what their local resource concerns are, um, you know, with, with cooperation with the partners and decide what's going to work in your neighborhood. So, our plan with the Grizzly Conflict Mitigation Targeted Implementation Plan is to provide cost share through EQIP on 27 of these projects over the next five years. Um, already, it looks like we are going to have much more demand than we have funding slated for, especially with the escalating price with fencing materials but we're, we're forging ahead. Our partners are, are very strong, both in being able to provide the, the credibility and, and kind of the, the grassroots support within the community because they're, they're very well established there and have a lot of trust, um, perhaps even more than NRCS, which we, we often pride ourselves with having a good relationship with producers and having that level of trust, but it, it's very, very much, uh, you know, synergistic relationship there for us. Um, I think that's probably all I need to say about uh, what we have going on right now, but uh, so I'll hand it back over to Alex, but it's just a good case study that this can work at a local level. Thanks, Josh, for sharing that story. And there's a really great video put together by the Blackfoot Challenge that describes the use of this drive over mat. So um, that'll be in the chat box here in just a minute. And I really just wanted to highlight one of the things that Josh just shared. 
you know, one of the benefits of being able to cost share with NRCS is that it supports producer implemented conflict prevention. Um, there are important and very complementary roles of agency implemented conflict prevention. And we think that together, um, the cost sharing through NRCS paired with agency implemented conflict prevention creates nice synergy and opportunities for collaboration. So um, with that, I will jump into our panel discussion, um, where again, you'll be hearing about different fencing practices that are being implemented across um, different types of landscapes. Um, knowing that there are so many different applications of fencing for conflict prevention, we're asking folks to participate in a survey. So producers who are out there using different fencing practices for uh, to, to prevent predation, if you would please consider taking the survey. Again, it'll be in the chat box in just a minute. We'd like to really be able to focus our efforts in meeting the demand where, where the need is, is greatest. So thanks for that. Um, our panelists today are Dave Rood, a supervisory wildlife biologist from USDA APHIS Wildlife Services in Wisconsin. Um, we also joining us from Montana and Thunder Road Farm is Bryce Andrews. Bryce is also the field and strategic advisor to people and carnivores. Um, just up the road from him a bit is, and to the east is Jim Stone from the Blackfoot Valley and the Rolling Stone Ranch. And um, we also have Russ Talmo joining from Defenders of Wildlife. So thanks everybody for being here. Really appreciate you all being willing to share your expertise. I think we'll just get started by if you all can share a little bit more about where you're located, what your landscape is like, and how you're using electric fencing or flattery in your work. And in particular, if you can speak to how you've used fencing innovatively, um, that would be great. And maybe Bryce, we'll just start with you. Great. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, so yeah, I, um, I, I'm a person who does two things in life, at least. Um, I am here in Montana on Thunder Road Farm on the Flathead Reservation, um, where my wife and I raise um, grass-finished cattle um, and also raise uh, commercial raspberries. Um, but I'm also the field and strategic advisor for People and Carnivores, which is a nonprofit group that focuses really on, you know, exactly the kind of innovation with um, conflict reduction, large carnivore coexistence tools that we're talking about today. So. In that capacity, between being a working ranch manager and a field advisor for a nonprofit group, I've worked with um, this specific type of electric fencing. So fencing for grizzlies and wolves um, to reduce conflict in, in most of its forms. So I've, I've worked um, with, you know, putting up uh, permanent fences made of high tensile wire, um, temporary fences. I've worked with flagery um, and we've worked to protect many different species. Um, we use fencing as one of the primary tools in our work, um, and it's extremely e effective for us. Um, one of the things, you know, so like we'll use it for things like mobile chicken coops for layers and meat birds. We'll use it for night pens for small livestock um, surrounding homesteads, um, like uh, Josh was discussing up in the Blackfoot, um, calving yards, all sorts of stuff. Um, and really, uh, you know, the take home thing is that this is a really ad adaptable, useful, functional tool, but it all has to do with how you apply it, how you execute it on the ground and how the, the application of the tool, um, matches the scenario. Cause it's really site specific. So yeah, that's me. And, and that's how I've used the tool. Thanks Bryce. We've already heard Bryce speak to some of the five factors Bree mentioned earlier talking about species, place, time, disturbances, landscape. So um, we'll pass it off now to Dave, who can talk more about using um, different fencing practices in, in the Great Lakes area. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I'll add a Midwestern perspective to the conversation. I've been working for wildlife services for over 30 years, but in Northern Wisconsin for the last 20 years, and spent a lot of my time working with, with bears and wolves. 
And fencing is a pretty important component of our predator conflict management programs here um, in northern and central Wisconsin. We probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 apiaries uh, fenced for black bears. So there was a reference, we're gonna talk about wolves and grizzlies. Well, um, we don't have grizzlies. We have a very uh, robust population of black bears, somewhere numbering about 24,000. But anyhow, approximately 800 apiaries fenced uh, for black bear protection. Um, I have used Fladry since 2004. I was probably second person in the nation besides um, Carter and Rick Williams in Idaho to use Fladry. I've been using it for a long time. Um, and you know we have a we have a fully recovered gray wolf population that numbers somewhere from 950 to 1400 animals and 250 different packs across the northern half of the state. Um, and the, they're still federally endangered. Um, and they were delisted de on 2001. Litigation vacated that ruling. Um, they're currently now relisted as federally endangered. And the last time they were federally endangered, that was for six years. And so that really limits the toolbox in which we have to um, resolve predator livestock conflict. And, you know, we've used these more temporary forms of, of predator abatement, fladry, uh, flashing lights, fox lights, noisemakers, et cetera. But when you try to manage conflict over a half a decade with these tools, uh, you run into packs that are highly habituated to these techniques. And, um, you know, Fladry, in my opinion, in the Midwest is the gold standard of non-lethal abatement. However, when you deploy it for a grazing season for five years, um, it, it has no efficacy. So we are struggling with tools and techniques, and we are extremely interested in building predator-proof fences, um, primarily wolf fences, which we have. Um, again, context, Midwest, um, a lot of our operations are 50 to 100 pair on a few hundred acres and, and permanent um, exclusionary fencing um, is, is an option. We've built several. Um, we're interested in this relationship with NRCS and, and EQIP and, and maybe we can synergize um, some long-term solutions on chronic farms. Uh, that deal with multiple wolf depredations annually. And, and you know, on average, um, Wisconsin will have 35 to 50 farms that sustain wolf depredations a year. Yep, that's a significant problem, Dave. And um, I really appreciate how you've been adapting fences to deal with the continued issues there. So thanks for your all of your innovation. Um, we'll kick it over to Jim uh, in the Blackfoot. Thank you, Alex. You all heard a little bit from Josh, so you got a little bit of a background on where we are, but the real basis for what we're doing with uh, electric fence is to manage this landscape in the best way for wildlife and domestic animals. And that's changed so much over time that we've gone away from the traditional barbed wire. Uh, a huge part of that is just cost. You can build about twice as much electric permanent electric fence as you can barbed wire uh if the maintenance is is much easier so here here's a number of things we're doing we're, we're doing five wire permanent electric around buildings calving areas that works ex really really well for grizzly bears and wolves we're fencing uh ranch borders neighbors with three wire permanent electric uh, that works very well for our huge concentrations of elk that can go over that fence, deer, other things that can go under, but it also controls domestic animals very well. We have uh, fairly large guest ranches in the valley. Uh, we do two wire electric fence there. So again, uh, with a 42 inch uh, top wire, uh, elk, deer can go over and under, but very, very successful in controlling large number of horses. We also use a lot of uh, single wire permanent electric uh, related to riparian areas, river corridors. So it just gives the wildlife a, a huge um, upswing and be able to move through that, but again, controls those areas for, for cattle uh, in most ways. And I think 
uh, on our ranch specifically, we're doing all of our internal fence is uh, temporary uh, poly wire. And that's just, again, dealing with all these wildlife numbers. It's just something that's very flexible. We can move cattle away from wildlife issues as in bears and wolves, as we see that. Our interest is in, in you know, forage utilization. So, you know, uh, high intensity, low duration, uh, grazing is where we're at, and we can talk more about that, but that really plays into how we manage our, our cows uh, against uh, grizzly bears and wolves. If we can we can get in and get out and move those cows uh, three to five days, they don't, you know, become sort of that, that cow that's there for a month or two. So it, it's a huge time saving, uh, money saving, and the results are incredible. So thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that win-win for wildlife and livestock production. It's great to hear, you know, that you can use a tool to manage grazing while also reducing the risk to predation at the same time. Um, you know, we've already heard a lot from panelists. This is super information dense already. So folks in the audience, if you want to ask follow-up questions, don't hesitate to type those into the Q&A box. And, and I want to come back to Russ as we talk about you know, tell us more about where you, your fencing projects take, take place and how you're innovating with your application of electric fencing. Sure, hi everybody. Um, my name is Russ Salmo and I work with Defenders of Wildlife out of our uh, Northern Rockies field office in Missoula, Montana. Um, we, um, well, I've been with Defenders for about a decade. Prior to that, um, I did bear management for fish, wildlife and parks here in Montana and cut my teeth on a lot of these tools uh, during that time, but the bulk of what I do um, is running Defenders Electric Fence Incentive Program, which offers cost sharing and technical assistance for anyone in our very sizable program area, uh, which straddles four states, um, and that is looking to secure bear attractants on their property uh, with electric fencing. And um, I also do some wolf work and, and flat reinstallation in our uh, partnership with Wildlife Services, but the, the bulk of what I do is, is with bears. Um, and our fencing program you know, it really originated through this grizzly bear um, to reduce grizzly bear conflicts and related mortalities and to promote grizzly bear recovery. But you know, there's a really direct um, benefit to producers and landowners in the process. And by providing financial and technical assistance, we've been able to dramatically increase the use of this tool um, by helping complete over 550 electric fence projects in the 12 years of this program. Um, but the majority of the you know, participants that I work with, which is you know, 50 to 70 per year, we're talking about small scale operations. So that's hobby farmers, folks with fruit trees or chickens or bees or um, other small livestock. Um, and it's using the various uh, fence designs that work for, for those um, type of operations, but also for um, a large uh, or for a handful of large scale commercial livestock projects each year. Um, Many of the folks that I work with have never used electric fencing or flattery for that matter before. Uh, so much of my job is really just building um, a comfort level with folks and trying to empower them to install these electric fences on their own with um, as much or as little technical guidance as necessary. Um, and then that um, financial assistance to help offset the cost. Um, uh, really that has a lot to do with just being a one man show and working in a very large area. but. Um, the larger, more complex projects, which are typically the commercial livestock uh, projects, I'm, I'm much more involved in the project planning um, and design and, and actually getting out there to swing the hammer. So um, that's me. Thanks, Russ. I mean, just with all of what you've shared already, we've heard about three of the four C's. So we're talking about conflict prevention practices. I really appreciate, Dave, you tying it back to a need to have a complete set of tools in the toolbox. Um, we've heard from other states where lethal control is not available that, you know, flattery becomes less and less effective over time as there are fewer tools. Um, and, and it's important to be able to, you know, help protect producers livestock. Um, and then Russ, you just spoke nicely to collaboration. So thank you all very much for helping to show how integrated all, all of the C's are. Um, you know, Russ also just spoke to partnerships, and I was hoping that you all could share a little bit more about how partnerships support electric fence projects um, in your neck of the woods and what makes those fencing partnerships successful. 
So Russ, we'll pass it back to you to answer that. So one of the things I was thinking about, it really wasn't that many years ago where NGOs weren't working together and agencies weren't working with NGOs and, and there's, you know, like this sort of territorial nature around conflict prevention projects. But nowadays, you know, from at least from a wildlife conservation perspective, um, pretty much everybody's getting into conflict prevention game and there's some drawbacks to that, but mostly it's really bringing more capacity to the effort. And that's what I think we all want to see. Um, people have started to realize we can do more together than we can individually. And even if we don't see eye to eye on everything, that still remains true. Um, my program relies very heavily um, on partnerships to really implement projects that take 50 to 60% of the projects that come through us are referrals from wildlife managers and agency personnel who are out there responding to conflicts and recognizing that those conflicts are going to continue unless some other steps are taken um, beyond removing you know, the offending bear or wolf or so um, or what have you. So uh, managers often have like lack the time and resources though to implement those projects um, at least alone and so they direct people to me um, to our program and or we collaborate together on getting those projects completed um, you know especially on the larger more costly projects uh, which again tend to be the commercial livestock projects uh, more partners help with the cost burden and also help with the necessary labor for installation. So um, a lot of that could not be done without partnership. And that's not fairly obvious, but it's it's integral. Thanks, Russ. And, and Jim, you know, I, I know we could have an entire webinar just about oh. partnership at the Blackfoot Challenge, but if you would talk about the value of partnership in, in your work there, that would be great. You bet, Alex. And we sort of use a term called neighboring up. And I think that gets past a little bit of the, the traditional, whether it's NRCS or defenders, it's about, we have to work with our neighbors and we have to look at this at a landscape level. If, if we're not sort of this ground up swell of trying to solve these problems with the help of the science and the boots on the ground of all our partners, uh, we're not gonna get there. So when I say neighboring up, that's that's sort of uh, landowners having to, you know, jump up and, and go out and meet and greet, you know, your neighbors and, and share the good successes that we can do by doing all this. But, you know, I can't, without talking about the NRCS and that, you know, Josh spoke very well uh, earlier, but they've been exceptional. They've been on the ground. They bring people from DC. We've done all kinds of testing with different wire spacings, to different products. They've been so flexible about letting us try these things. And, you know, sometimes within these programs, that's not always the case. But uh, just really thankful to, to his leadership and all of his crew in Montana that, that just makes that a whole lot easier step. And then when you're working with a group called the Blackfoot Challenge, that brings 160 other partners that you can neighbor up with. And in order to get this done, it takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of faith in your neighbor that things are going to be better. And so, you know, it's, it's not a sexy uh, thing to talk about all the time but when you do this it really works and I just think that again it's got to come from your own community you've got to have that faith in that and then these people on top of the scientists make it work yeah thanks Jim um you know that's an ex a perspective from landowner to landowner partnering um neighboring up and Dave what's your take on that from an agency perspective Well, in Wisconsin, we've got, you know, a really strong working relationship with the Wisconsin DNR. So when I talk about those 800 bear fences, you know, that's a partner program between us, the Wisconsin DNR, and the affected landowner. And they have to enroll into the wildlife damage abatement and claims program. And then through a cooperative agreement between our agency the County Land and Water Committee and the Wisconsin DNR will provide them the equipment on site and roll them into the program uh, to fence these, these beehives or these apiaries. Um, you know, so that's you know, an excellent cooperative relationship between different agencies, as federal, state, and county, in, including the private landowner. Um, you know, so that's the wildlife damage abatement claims program and bears fall underneath that. Gray wolves don't. And where, where, where we are really struggling in, in Wisconsin is, is trying to come up with the fiscal resources to do these 
wolf proof fences on these cow calf operations or, or sheep operations. You know, the last one we built was, was $8 a linear foot. And if you go around to 40, you come up with $40,000. And, you know, we're, we're, we need to do projects that are several hundred acres to resolve these, these long-term conflicts between wolves and, and cattle. So, you know, we, we need partnership. We, ne we need cooperation between our agency, uh, the Wisconsin DNR. They're willing to cost share some of these projects. And, and you know, in, in the same township where we're doing a, a wolf-proof fence, uh, NRCS and EQIP, they'll be doing a rotational grazing fence. It, it just seems like there could be some synergy between um, the, the different agencies there to um, potentially do uh, forage management through rotational grazing, but on the exterior, um, uh, let's keep the bears and wolves out of there. Thanks for that. Yeah, um, it's interesting to think about a one USDA approach to application of these practices. So. I know that's something when I was a wildlife services employee, you know, that, that term when USDA came to the fore and it's interesting to continue to think about its application. Um, Bryce, can you talk about how partnerships support your work in, in electric fence projects? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think what you're hearing, I mean, I, I think everything that's been said by the other panelists makes a ton of sense to me. And I think partnerships are, are essential because of the fact that you almost never have a situation where the person who's in control of the land is, is in a position to afford, install, and fund the kind of fence that needs to be there. And that's why partnerships are so important. If I would say this, I would say like what, what makes a fencing project like this work is three things. You have to have the money, you have to have the expertise to implement the fence with best practices. And you have to have a commitment to long-term outcomes and to maintenance. And that's one more thing to talk about. And that comes from that kind of ground up community support that Jim was, was touching on. Um, these kind of projects, they're really site specific and they're fairly complex and they're expensive. So there's really, in my mind, like when we work on these things and they work out well, it's because we have that kind of three-legged stool going on where like you've got somebody with the local knowledge of their operation and the commitment to maintain it. You've got a group and often that's the role that we're in at people and carnivores coming in saying, okay, we've nerded out on this for a couple decades. This is how we think these need to be built. And then you have a third partner who, who can come in and say, you know, you guys couldn't afford this on your own or you certainly couldn't afford to do 27 of them on the landscape we're going to help you do that. So to me, that kind of coming together and, and making sure that that relationship's strong, not only in the install phase, but also in the years that follow, um, because there will be troubleshooting, there will be maintenance, even though this is a very low maintenance tool in comparison to some other ones. I think that stuff is, is the important part of partnership that, that's essential to this work. Thanks. For that, you know, we've already touched on so much of what is necessary to make a fencing project successful. But, you know, um, and Bryce, you just talked about the need for long term maintenance. So so what do you think what in your experience with all of your projects makes it successful and how do we learn from past fencing projects to ensure that future projects are successful? So if you guys uh, want to start talking about that and maybe Dave, I'll pick on you first. Sure. Um, you know, again, the Wisconsin example, um, we've been fencing wildlife for decades here. And again, in the wildlife damage abatement claims program, you know, so the touch on maintenance of fences, um, you know, that, that program covers bears, elk, deer, turkeys and Canada geese. So we've been building eight foot net wire fences for white-tailed deer and row crop protection for decades. And part of that is it's a 15 year contract that the landowner has to uh, sign up for where we, we do an annual fence inspection every year 
to make sure that fence is up to construction standards and it's excluding the wildlife that it was designed to exclude. And if it's not, then there can be revocation from the program and a, a, potentially the landowner would have to pay back the remaining balance of that fence install um, on the remaining period of the contract. So, you know, there, there are tools and, and, and methods in order to ensure fences are maintained. Um, you know, I, I, when you're out on the landscape working with landowners and you're dealing with, um, you know, mom and dad and the kids and the, the farm's been in the family for several generations, um, you know, odds are that farm's gonna be a productive farm for another several generations, or at least hopefully. And, and you know, that's where we're looking to uh, put our fiscal resources. Thanks, you just spoke to something that's like becoming more and more important to me in my work, and that is understanding that place identity, something that Hannah Jakes talks about in her book, The Atlas of Conflict Reduction. So shameless plug, but many of the voices you see here are represented in the book. So um, I will pass it over now to Russ to you know, share from some of your experience about ensuring projects stay successful. I think that um, what a lot of us see is that when it comes to flattery specifically, but electric fence too, is that people are skeptical of their success or like, can will they work? Like, how are these flags supposed to stop a wolf pack? Or how is this little fence supposed to stop a huge bear? And I get it. I mean, I, I, I would wonder that too. Um, it just so happens I've been doing it for 15 years and I've seen it work enough times and we have enough like body of work to go off of to know that it works. Um, so, you know, a big part of, um, oh, I also point out they're not perfect or flawless, but man, they are damn effective if used properly. And so to me, it's successful if, if it's solving the problem that it intended, you know, the con if it's stopping the conflict that we, that the fence was intended for, that's success. Um, if it's providing people peace of mind, you know, if it's, Again, doing its job and that takes a little bit of the load off then that's a success um if it continues to be used and maintained over time you know just like bryce mentioned like that's a big one um like david hit on it too there but um that's not always easy especially if you're skeptical about it going into it and so you know a big part of how we achieve that is is trying to have um landowner or producer buy-in like we're, we're putting our you know money where our mouth is and and trying to help these projects you know, we want not just the willingness to do it from from our participants, but whatever sort of contribution to the project that makes sure that they're invested in its success too, whether that's money, materials, labor, what have you. Um, but that ensures it's like long-term use, long-term success, long-term maintenance over time. Um, and, you know, in the end, with the skepticism in mind, if we're making believers out of people that these tools work and they're willing to use them and they're willing to tell other folks that they work, that's a lot more powerful coming from neighbor to neighbor than it is coming from someone like me. So uh, that's what success looks like in my mind. Yeah, I think what Russ just shared is really important because a lot of, in my experience, you know, there, some of these practices are approached pretty skeptically at first. And so um, it's important to be able to work with someone who is skeptical about the project and, and, meet them where they're at and and still be able to bring additional producers into using these practices. And again, the four C's approach is really important when you're you're trying to bring in new techniques. So um, I think next up is Jim, if you would talk a little bit about how these fencing projects are so successful in your neck of the woods. That I, Alex, you know, it's relationships, 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 right? I mean, that's what builds collaboration, and sometimes that's the hardest piece is to to make that all come together. You know, sometimes the fence is the easy part, but I think we just can't talk enough about how important those relationships are across the whole spectrum. And I would say maybe we haven't reached out enough thinking about technology. Is that you know, I mean, Tesla is making better batteries, and we could use better technology for solar 
uh, all kinds of things. I think that's something we could be working with corporate partners to help us maybe expand that and come up with new products that will help us do that. But I think the most important part is that people that really love grizzly bears, wolves, all the critters that are out west, we need to build a relationship with them that the West is open and these, these are the places that these critters are gonna live and survive. And I think having that conversation about how we all do it together, not just in the Blackfoot, not just in the West, but nationwide, how do we, how do we ensure success of not only the, the action of electric fencing, but really the end result of maintaining and, and holding these really special critters together. And I know that's a tougher, way to say it, but I just think there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, capacity and there's a lot of heart in that that we really haven't reached out to. Yeah, and you know, um, as part of a different project I was working on with Jared, we were interviewing tourists in Yellowstone and what became clear was that people visiting Yellowstone didn't understand that um, the working land surrounding the park was you know, providing very important wildlife <laughs> habitat for the wolves that are using the park and, and, and other species that we're talking about here today. So what you just said about, you know, um, how do we maintain a landscape that works for everybody is about maintaining a landscape that works for ranching too. So um, I think next is Bryce. If you'll just, you know, help us close out on these formal questions and then we'll move into the question and answer. So keep the questions coming. I appreciate those that are already there. You know, how can we learn from past projects to ensure future projects are successful, Bryce? Yeah, I mean, I would certainly echo what's been said here, and particularly what what Jim just said about the the partnerships and and people working together. And I would just kind of ice that cake with this: that the fence that you put in has got to be built according to best practices. And what's really cool is that the people who are on this screen right now, we, like we finally know a lot more than we used to about that. What a, what a really good effective permanent fence for this looks like. And that's a really good thing because we didn't always have that. And that took a lot of work by people like, like Russ and Jim and, and us. And you know we've worked very hard at this and we're to the point where we can understand it a little bit better. And that's really good going forward when you start thinking about making practices and, and, and making things that have technical specifications. I would say, um, to that point, the NRCS has got to be just about the perfect entity to carry those kind of best practices forward. Because as somebody who's been a ranch manager and has worked with the NRCS, I know what it's like to put up a 48 inch tall fence when you're supposed to put a 42 inch tall fence and have to go back and make that right. And, and that's occasioned frustration for me in a couple moments, but it really matters what height the bottom wire on a bare fence is. And I think it's really cool that working with an agency like the NRCS, you could you can really make people toe that line in a way that's extremely important um, and have that information for them so that what they build is really gonna work. I'm just gonna say two other things here about what makes these things successful, just to add on to this good body of knowledge, monitoring. You got to be able to, to record the ways in which these things work. And that's inherently difficult because of the animals you're working with and the scale that we're all almost always working on in the West. Um, but you know, using trail cameras and other monitoring to make sure that we know when these things work, that helps people believe in it and support it. Um, and last thing I would say is you got to use, it's important to use other tools in the conflict reduction toolbox. So for us, that might be things like scare devices, livestock guardian dogs, human presence in the form of a range rider. But, you know, what makes these projects successful is the degree to which you can integrate them with an existing agricultural operation and integrate them with the rest of the toolkit and get them built according to the best available knowledge. Thank you, Bryce. I, you know, you just brought up a couple of really important things, integrating them into the operation. And that's why, again, we think that cost sharing with NRCS is so important because it allows producers to who know their operations best and understand what's realistic and, and what they can actually maintain over time. It gives them the opportunity to be in control of that conversation. Um, and
experience and you can stack others on top of that. So we know, for example, um, one sheep producer in Oregon, night pens his sheep and the herder is camped on one side of the night pen and the fox lights are on the far side of the night pen. So really great examples of how producers can, you know, pair these practices together to provide the best level of deterrence. And then when all else fails, being able to engage in all four C's is really important. So um, with that, I think we wanna take some questions from the audience now. So we're gonna come back to that question on collaboration in just a minute, but while we're talking about specifics of fencing, um, let's go to Bob's question. So how long do different types of fences remain effective? That's a question we sort of left unanswered in, in our discussion. So, and then what kinds of changes are most e effective in extending the effectiveness? And how should those changes be implemented? So um, Dave, do you wanna take a first stab at, at how long different types of fencing remain effective? Sure, um, so it depends on what kind of fencing we're talking about. You know, and if we're talking turbo flat rate, in my opinion, that's temporary fencing. Um, in Wisconsin, you can maybe prevent depredations by gray wolves on beef calves for um, maybe a grazing season, maybe, you know, maybe six months, but it depends on um, intensity of exposure to flattery. If, if there's multiple beef farms in a wolf packed territory, or if the natural prey abundance is relatively high and they're in that area of their territory uh, fairly infrequently, flattery may work for an entire grazing season. If a particular group of wolves are exposed to flattery on a weekly basis, you may only have 30 to 60 days efficacy out of flattery. And you know, when I'm talking about our wolf-proof fencing projects that we're um, installing on some chronic farms in northern Wisconsin, you know, these are long-term. This is a, a one and done. Um, as, as long as the, the material is not degraded, um, their efficacy will, will be for decades. So it's uh, electric fencing in black bears, uh, as long as your solar energizer is charged. Um, you have an effective um, uh, bear abatement technique long-term. Electricity and, and black bears works extremely well. Um, so it's, it's relative to the kind of fencing you're using. Um, if it's permanent, um, net wire, uh, 72 inch tall with a 42 inch apron, decades, bladdery, a high rate of uh, wolf. You know, so how long do these do these tools last? Um, electric fencing for black bears and apiary protection, you know, th that's a permanent solution. As, as long as there's some maintenance, you, you test your voltage, you test your fencer, your energizer, um, you know, those 800 projects we have on the landscape, it's, um, there's probably one or two of those that are breached annually by black bears. Um, extremely effective tool. And, you know, the, the, the net wire um, fence projects that we're doing for wolves, you know, the efficacy of those, that's, that's long-term. That can be um, multi-decade as long as the materials are not degrading and, and we have um, net fences, net wire fences for deer and row crop protection that have been out there for 20, 25 years. So just to, yeah, what we're hearing there is the electric fence, um, permanent electric fence have a very long lifespan um, and flagery, just to clarify, has typically, uh, the, the recommendation is that it is put up and taken down within a 60 to 90 day timeframe. And um, I think one of the real challenges that you heard Dave speak to earlier is that if that is one of the only tools that's available in an area and you're putting it up on neighboring ranches over time to accommodate everybody's slightly different calving seasons um, it, it, within a single PAX territory. Does that increase the rate of habituation of that pack to the flagery? And what we heard Dave say earlier is yes. So again, that's why community approach to this is so important, right? Um, and, and really making sure that these tools stay effective over time. Um, so we had one follow-up question. 
uh, especially as we were hearing from many different folks talking about the height of the bottom wire, that being important for bears. We heard you talk about that, Dave, for wolves. Will wolves dig under a fence to get to livestock? Absolutely. And that's why these permanent fences, these um, wolf-proof fences that we're working on, um, they have a 42-inch apron attached to the bottom of the vertical net wire fence uh, that extends outward. So if they do come to the bottom of the, of the net wire fence and try to dig, that apron will prevent them from doing it. That's, that's key to these, these, these projects, in my opinion. Thanks. Another example of more innovation. Um, so folks, panelists that have made it back, feel free to jump in and provide any additional information. We had a question previously about collaboration and, you know, knowing that a lot of, you know, if we're talking about shared landscapes, a lot of that's occurring across land ownership boundaries. So Josh, um, do you want to speak to, you know, how NRCS works on projects that cross land ownership boundaries and maybe I can come back and share a little bit of how we're engaging with the Forest Service on some of this work? Sure. Um, you know, one of the one of the ways that the Montana focused conservation model for delivering equip works is specifically having neighbors who have similar objectives and a similar resource concern that that can be treated together. Um, the two the two projects that we are working on right now in the Blackfoot are adjacent landowners um, where the the grizzly fence has a, a common boundary actually along the property line. Um, so the two fences butt right up against each other. It takes in two calving lots and two headquarters areas. Um, one of the reasons that that was a high priority for us to fund and it ranked very well is because of the high concentration of attractants there. Um, <clears throat> so in, in that case, it worked out very well. There's uh, certainly projects that we look at where, where neighbors don't get along nearly as well and, and collaboration is difficult. And that's, I think that just goes back to what Jim was saying about the importance of relationships. And it's, it's at every level. It's between NGOs and agencies and that interaction between private operators and those, those entities, but also between private operators together. Um, so it's, it, you know, like, like all of us have, have probably come to realize it's the human aspect that is the most challenging part of dealing with wildlife conflict by far. Um, so that's, you know, it's, it's just about establishing credibility, being honest and, and working with people the way you'd like to be worked with. Yeah, uh, um, trust is critical in all of these projects. And um, one of the ways that, you know, we're learning about that is through some of our partners on the CalSIG that are working um, with their Forest Service um, range cons to try to implement some of these practices on their permits. So one example is a sheep producer who's night penning and um, that sheep producer has the flexibility to, you know, come back to the same night pen for a week and graze sort of in a spoken wheel style um, grazing pattern out of that that night pen. Another producer tried to implement a night pen and the Forest Service um, regulated that that night pen be moved every night. And so what we're really, you know, trying to work towards is flexibility within account with accountability on these permits so that producers can adapt to you know, all of the changes that are happening on the landscape, whether that's fire or wildlife, drought, um, and implement these practices in a way that allows them to be the best stewards of the land they can be. So um, just want to acknowledge that, you know, some of these practices do apply um, in a permittee situation and, and we're talking with the Forest Service about ways to accommodate those. So, um, Trying to remember what the other questions were. Um, we are hearing that additional photos would be really helpful and um, we'll be following up with some of that information in the future and a producer toolkit that will be coming out 
down the road, but we might be able to get some preliminary photos out sooner than later. So thanks for that request. Um, we're at 1.30 now. Um, folks, if, if you have any additional questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. We'll give everybody just a minute here. Three, or uh, I'm sorry, Alex, could I chime in with something else from the NRCS perspective? Absolutely. So, you know, one, one thought as we're going through this is a, a big consideration for us. Um, and certainly with our partners, uh, particularly the Fish and Wildlife Service, was that in, in implementing these fences to exclude grizzly bears, we wanted to make sure that we were considering what impact that had on habitat fragmentation across the landscape too. Um, we're careful not to include riparian areas within these exclusion fences because those are such strong corridors. And, and for NRCS, this is really about making a landscape where, where agriculture and predators could coexist together. Um, a, a big part of the way that we justified doing the grizzly fencing was that it actually makes habitat better for grizzly bears because we're, we're keeping them out of these habitat sinks, these biological traps of where they access human attractants and food sources. That's the highest probability of where they're going to end up either being trapped and transferred or euthanized and removed from the population. So it, it's, it's, it's very much a balancing act between wildlife being able to coexist with agriculture and making sure that that lives and livelihood and that wildlife resource are being protected. Thanks for summing that up so very well. Um, yep, uh, that concept of, you know, maintaining habitat permeability across landscape by keeping these tools and, and, and selecting their, you know, place, time, um, the species, the landscape use and, and different within the context of the disturbances occurring across landscape. These five factors that Bree outlined so clearly at the beginning of our talk really help ensure that these practices can be put on to the landscape in a way that is a win-win for wildlife and livestock. So um, really appreciate you all joining today. Uh, just one more um, shameless plug. You heard Bryce talk about, um, you know, how important the details and the site-specific application of, of different fencing practices are. So keep an eye out um, on people in Carnivore's video uh, feed. They will be releasing a how-to series uh, of videos uh, with a couple of different types of fence applications there in the next couple of months or so. And then again, just a reminder, um, we appreciate everybody joining for our second webinar in the three-part series. Next month, October 18th, we'll be meeting same time um, to talk about carcass management. And we'll have another set of producer voices um, and pers agency perspectives to share with you then. So thank you very much for joining us and have a great afternoon.